the NCAA tournament in the madness. Boy, Part it got weird yesterday. It did. We signed off at 1230 yesterday because the Oregon Ducks, uh, they rolled. They, South they played a basketball yesterday. game and they beat the ever living crap. Absolutely out of South Carolina. <laughs> dominated the dojo yesterday with Jermaine Kustard going for 40 burger a on him. 40 piece. Woo setting a Ducks tournament record. That was a, a career high for him, too. Indeed. I was, I was reading that he had scored 40 points one other time in his career, and it was in high school. <laughs> It's a good time to have your first 40-piece you know, yeah, in college, right? I, I, I feel like that's the right time to have that game. Yep, and uh, Oregon ended up uh, easily advancing past the six-seed South Carolina, 87-73. But, boy, that was just the beginning of things to come yesterday. Yesterday, it wasn't the best basketball uh, for 18 hours yesterday. No, there were, some, uh, there were some stinkers in there. But I'll be damned if it wasn't exciting all the way through. And that's the beauty of the NCAA tournament. And being here at a a at the Stadium Sports Bar, it was electric. Seeing people live and die, riding the highs and lows of their brackets, of their bets, of everything that was going on yesterday at the Stadium Sports Bar and Grill. A fun day, I will say. Absolutely awesome day. Uh... I will say that uh, Samford got screwed. Samford did get screwed. They, we'll get to that. Uh, but uh, I will say the uh, the parlay action saved at the end. Yeah, yeah, it well, did for you. It yeah, did. Yeah. We, well, we had a lot of lot of, lot of happy Samford let's, covered fans. Let's get let's get this out of the way first and foremost. Mm. Last night, the North Carolina State Wolfpack won eighty to sixty seven. And when you say the parlay saved the day. There was a dunk on a run out. 37 seconds left in the game, and there was a run out. Because uh, I looked at you with about, I want to say, five minutes to go in that game. And I go, all right, if the over here hits. You needed 14 points in like the last three and a half three minutes. And a half minutes. Yeah, I go, this is dicey, but they're playing quick. They might, they might get this. You hit the over on that parlay with a meaningless dunk for uh -huh. North Carolina State. And the only reason why it happened was because... It was a true run out. Ball got deflected yep. into the backcourt, and there was only one member of the North Carolina State Wolfpack, and he just went down, slammed it through. Mm -hmm. And those those points matter. Those points That's matter. That's not a meaningless no, bucket. No, those, those, those points meaningful. matter. Because when that happened, I believe Sanford was still down double digits and firmly out of the game, and then they started to make Ooh. their run, and it went, do you believe in miracles? Let's go. Now, Samford got host. They did. That was a – there was a block at the end of that game. It was the block that dreams are made of. It, it truly was. A you chase had down. A, a, you had a fast break dunk by Kansas. Yep. White guy goes up, two hands, <laughs> cocks it back. Clearly not that athletic. <laughs> and then there was the Samford player. I, I've never seen anything like it. He did not make any contact with his body. With his arms, with his hands. He put his hands ball. squarely between the two hands of the Kansas player who was dunking the ball, and he smacked it off the backboard. A long rebound goes out, and Samford gets it, and all the Kansas guys are running the opposite direction. And then tweet, tweet. Whistle. Foul. Unreal. And, and I love – Samford's coach came out, and he said, he's like, look, we're not blaming it on one call. We're not going to blame the refs on that. I would. It, you could see why you would blame him for that. But they said, we're not just going to blame it on one call. We had our opportunities, and we were unable to do it. And I, I appreciate that. That's the adult in the room there. But nah. if I'm a Sanford player, I am furious. Yeah. Because how does that game play out after that? You get that run out, you have the opportunity to take a lead for Sanford. If I'm not mistaken, also, that was a uh, Pac-12 ref crew. Now, are we serious? Yeah, I'm dead serious. That it was Pac-12. Yeah, Pac-12 basketball officiating isn't <laughs> Pac-12 football. We know that. And actually, Pac-12 football, it wasn't as bad as some of the the SEC's going the through. The SEC a, had a rough a, year. A football. They had a rough year. Officiating crisis yeah. right now. So the last year of the Pac-12, though, going really well. Pac-12 basketball doing really great well. down the stretch here. Yeah. Uh, Oregon State and Washington State. Thanks everybody for participating. Yeah, we'll get to that um, coming up today. We have the. Uh, Odyssey party bus has arrived. Indeed. Um, shenanigans will ensue. I think we can all assume that to be 
true? Yes, I've heard more than a few people are staying overnight tonight. There we go. So there we go. And uh, the right call. The, the right facility move. is uh, is filling up. I mean, it was it was yeah. packed to the gills yesterday for Oregon, and I assume it will be again tomorrow as Oregon plays again. Yeah. But we're 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 pretty full in here. I'd say the uh, the the tables are also getting a lot of action in front of us. They're, yeah, the tables are open. You got the they're open earlier than they were yesterday yes. too. And and that's a that's a good sign for things to come. I think Friday, you know, it's, it's a lot easier to, make to say happen. I'm taking off a little early and I'm going to go out and uh, go to A and A and sit in the sports book and 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 check out all the offerings that A and A has to give you. Well. Friday, today's your day. Yeah. Today is your day, and uh, I, I'm pumped for it. We do have some Fan Madness All-Stars, though, and they need to be mentioned right now. Oh, are we going to? Yeah. Ah. Uh, no. Uh, we have <laughs> Philly Ryan is is probably one of my new favorite characters that I've met in the area. He is the most Philly Philly that is ever yeah. Philly. Yeah. He is, from, he is from Philadelphia. He has a wicked accent. Yeah. And that wicked accent actually won him... Won him some money. Uh, uh, an absurd amount of money on yes. a parlay. He tried to get the first half over, but because of his Philly accent, when he went up to the sports book, he said, first, uh, he said first half o- over, and the guy didn't understand him, so he gave him first half and game over. over. That ramped up his parlay. parlay. And at the he had the one bet that he needed was Dayton. He needed it came Dayton through in the clutch on the money line, and Dayton comes roaring back from down 17, mm-hmm. and he was going absolutely nuts at the stadium sports bar yesterday. It was one of those things that you sit back and you look at and you go, "Oh my gosh." That's where that's where the gambling dreams are made. The right gambling there. gods came through for him. Yeah, unequivocally. And, and then we've got another all star. I don't even know his name, but I posted two photos of this man on Twitter oh, yesterday. God. Just tremendous stuff. And we talked about him during our very long and arduous uh, half hour broadcast yesterday before Come we on, handed off to the Ducks. Twenty four minutes. But this man was wearing a jorts jumper mm-hmm. to start the day, which we were like, "How can you beat that?" Yeah. Well, he was wearing Iowa socks, and he said it's an ode to Caitlin Clark not punting, which is fair. Indeed. Uh, with his jorts jumper, he goes, I got a wardrobe change for you. This man did not disappoint. If you go to Dusty underscore hair on Twitter, he came back in, like, the only thing that I can describe it as is 1970s porn cowboy. The, I think the simplest way to go is Champ Kind. He from, did look uh, like he, Anchorman. He did have a good Champ Kind look, and he said, "I go, I got to get another picture of this." He goes, "Make sure you get my turquoise in it." And he had a piece of turquoise the oh, size of a turtle body. He was rocking a bolo tie, white cowboy boots. He 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 had he was a vibe yesterday, and his parting words last night when I saw him in the lobby is like, "I got one more." So I'm I'm on the edge of my seat with what this man comes back with today. But we are now creating fan madness all-stars that uh, they'll live in infamy. They will live in infamy. Philly Ryan is one. The Cowboy is another. The Jorts Cowboy is another. And then uh, Jake the Hater is is here. He has been just posted up with P1 Leave Us. They've been here all day. We got P1 Rufio's in the building today. Indeed. We've got Keith is P1 Keith in the garbage truck. He's here watching all the action. It is this is this is where working and doing this job is the most fun. It comes together. Yeah, we get to see all the people. You get to see people living and dying in sports. It's awesome. And we're already one game in. First game of the day went to overtime. North Northwestern and FAU yep. go to overtime to start day it's two of madness. Uh, absolute train wreck of a basketball game. And we've got some uh, March Madness happening big time as uh, Marquette in Western Kentucky. Yeah. Uh, Marquette's struggling. Oh. Struggling with the Hilltoppers. Yeah, but, I mean, they've regained their composure a little bit, and that's going to be the big one. We talked about this yesterday. You know, Tyler Kolek, their uh, star player, has been dealing with that abdominal strain, the oblique strain um, on his right side. If he is not at 100%, this is going to be really interesting to see where Marquette goes because that's a two seed that we could see falling to the Hilltoppers. And I am pro-chaos. I'm an agent of chaos. I want chaos. And right now at the half, 
you have the Hilltoppers with a 43-36 lead over Marquette. Yeah, I have Marquette going bum, to the lead eight, bum, so bum. that's uh, yeah. that one's tough for me. Uh, it hurt. Also at the half, you have San Diego State, uh, UAB. Take care, business. San Diego State up by six at the break, and this is uh, UAB's got some shooters, man. They've got some shooters. This is going to be interesting. If they catch fire in that second half, six points can go boom like that. I, I'm, I'm here for all the madness. As my wife said several times on this station, it's time for the madness. Indeed. And we are here. We are here. I'm pumped, man. Uh, we've got more than just uh, NCAA tournament action, even though we will have a lot uh, of that today. Has Marvin Harrison tipped his hand to where he wants to go? That will be on today's program. Marvin Harrison Jr. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I was we, we, assuming we that. We don't say that man's name. I, I, uh, I was assuming <laughs> that we weren't talking about Marvin Harrison Sr. Yeah, we do not we do not say his name without the senior and junior. We have some G League news. Um, yeah. That is actually of note. Indeed. That we got to discuss. And uh, we got a, a little bit of college football, too, to sprinkle in for you today. So. It's going to sports hard today. It, it, who are we kidding? It's only going to sports as hard as the Fan Madness All-Stars. Indeed. Allow us to. Because this this show will get sideways very quickly. In the next hour and a half, I'm guessing. Insert booze. We have an hour and a half. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Before things start really getting squirrely. But uh, we are off and rolling here. We are at Fan Madness, presented by George McCoy at Warren Allen Attorneys at Law. Uh, ALNA, the Stadium Sports Bar and Grill. If you are planning on watching any of the action today, come on up. We are up here in Ridgefield. If you're in the area, swing by, say hi. Uh, where we got to start this thing? Your bracket, if it's busted, you're not alone. Danny and Dusty on the fan. Hello, sports.
A rejoiner so nice, we played it twice. We are at ALNA, the stadium sports bar. It is Fan Madness. And hey, if you are not able to come to Fan Madness today and you missed yesterday, that's okay. We got twice the madness. George McCoy at Warren Allen Attorneys at Law and Coors Light present Fan Madness Thursday from noon to 7 at X Golf Tualatin and Friday from noon to 7 X Golf Vancouver. What could be better than watching the tourney with great food, beverages, and playing world class golf courses on the best simulators around? Come on down next week, Thursday, X Golf Tualatin. Friday, X Golf Vancouver. We're back. We're going to be broadcasting live. We're going to be live. Isaac Atsuk going to be live. And Fan Madness is brought to you by George McCoy at Warren Allen Attorneys at Law. Injuries and missing work are ruining your day. Call George McCoy at WarrenAllen.com. He'll make them pay. And also, Bakur's Light. I love it. Uh, this is this is great. And we we can't thank George McCoy at Warren Allen Attorneys at Law Enough and Alan A for hosting us for, for this, the first uh, two days of the tournament. It's awesome to be out here and it eases all of the pain of your bracket being in shambles because did yes. you see the stats coming out of yesterday? After the first two games of the tournament, only 65% of brackets, or excuse me, only 45% of brackets were perfect. After the dust settled on a full day of action yesterday, that has dropped even more. As of uh, this morning, before the games tipped off, less than 0.0001% of brackets at MarchMadness.com and ESPN.com remained perfect. Yeah, I. how did you do on yours? Not great, Bob. I mean, it's okay, all things considered. Yeah. But uh, it's it's definitely not I, – I, I'm not in the money yet. Actually, I am in the money in a couple of my pools. Mm -hmm. But as far as, like, the big ones go, no, it, it's not it's not going well. I think on ESPN I am ranked 10,000th. That's 10,000? No, 10 millionth, sorry. Oh, okay. 10,047,247th. That's not bad. It's not bad. I no. still got I still got my final fours intact. Yet uh, I'm still we're still we're both still three, cooking there. Three three of them have yet to play again. Yeah, Mar well, I've got <laughs> well, Marquette in my elite eight. That's gonna dice me up a little bit. I am see I am six hundred forty four thousand five hundred eighty third. I'm in the top million. The, uh, top million. There you go. Top million. You're rolling with your top million. So yeah, and, yeah. And I had I had four losses with uh, yesterday with two of them being teams that advanced beyond that round so uh not feeling comfortable yeah it didn't didn't feel great <laughs> not feeling comfortable right now but uh we're we're alive in a lot of different places i don't think anything uh like i don't i, I don't think any of my elite eight teams lost yesterday every team that i had losing i had them losing in the the round of right. 32 oh yeah. uh, no can except for kentucky yeah, I had Kentucky Except as a Sweet Kentucky. 16 team. Yeah, I did too. Yep. Kentucky's going to screw me. And look, if Marquette doesn't uh, get it together, they're going to screw me too. I yeah. saw that. This may be the more jarring stat of, of all of them. So there's .0001% of brackets that are still perfect. Indeed. There are 18 brackets out there that do not have a single pick correct. I think that that's, that's more harder. impressive than point zero 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 one percent. There was somebody who was giving away like a million bucks if you could pick every game wrong. I mean, uh, just think of what we saw yesterday, though. You had three eleven six upsets. That means somebody had South Dakota State beating Iowa State. Eighteen people had South Dakota State beating Iowa State, and that game was eighty-two to sixty-five. And it's, it wasn't that close. It wasn't that close at all. You had eighteen people also. On top of that random pick, they had Moorhead State beating Illinois, which they lost by, was it 16 points uh, yesterday? You had. You had somebody pick uh, Baylor over North Carolina. It just, but this is bizarro world that we have going on here. But uh, 18 brackets remain with no perfect picks after one day. I, we, we salute you. I think that, and I honestly do, I think that they may be in that million dollars to pick the wrong bracket. I mean, they, that, that is the only logical yeah. explanation as to how you get to that point. It, 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 it's almost, uh, maybe it is more statistically impressive 
to because go over. Not only wow. that, like the number's going to be lower because less people are doing it that way. But still, to it, you're just as likely to get it right as you are to get it wrong. 50-50. You got a 50-50 shot. It, but I think that when you get down in the when you get the first opening rounds, it may be easier to go zero. But as you as get you later it into harder. the tournament, it's the other way it's around harder, winning. Yeah, to to pick the winners yep. because, I mean, you get chalk. Chalk is easy. You know, the top three seeds are usually the ones that you see dancing at the end of the day. Well, not just that. There's the the, the math basically says that upsets are significantly more likely in the first round. As weird yeah. as that is, uh, even though teams get better, the better team usually wins later in the tournament. Which is why when you see Cinderella stories, they just they run out of gas. Well, and that, like taking a look at just what happened yesterday. I mean, the 11 seeds went three and zero yesterday. You had Oregon uh, going in, in winning, NC State feeling the burns with DJ Burns. That's a big boy. Do you see what CBS did to him after the game? No. What they do to my Husky King? So if you don't know, six he's listed at six nine two seventy five. He's three thirty. On a good day. <laughs> DJ Burns, he's a big boy, but he is nimble. Oh, he, he, is he nimble. said he studied Hakeem Olajuwon, but he ended up built like Zach Randolph. Mm, Robert Tractor Trailer. Uh, yeah. But he is a guy that when you watch him, like anybody looking for the next like guy who's going to transition from being a college basketball player to playing in the NFL. There's more than a few people who are saying it. See, that guy put a, put a hand in the dirt. Dude, because he's nimble. He's light on his feet. He's 6'9", so he's long. You know, he moves so well for his size. But after the game, uh, they end up giving him a bowl of ice cream in the in the post. Wow. Is that who that was in for? The, the sprinkled thing? They gave they gave ice oh, cream to him. Wow. And on the surface, like I was watching go, whoa, they just said we're gonna give the fat guy some ice cream. It turns out the tradition in North Carolina State, which is maybe why he is sitting at three thirty instead of two seventy five, <laughs> is after a win. They celebrate in the locker room with ice cream. They didn't set that up in the post-game interview. They just said, here's here's to getting a head start on your ice cream, and they hand him this bowl of ice cream, and he's looking at it like, what? Here you go, fatty. <laughs> like, if they were to do that with Ben Middlebrooks last night, who balled out of his gore. Also for, a guy who has great post-footwork. Yeah, yeah. Just, just absolutely post-spun and drop step that team to death. Well, and you said this about Ben Middlebrooks last night. If you were to say, what does a Ben <laughs> Middlebrooks look like? Th that is it. AI could not generate no. a you, more Ben Middlebrooks looking person than Ben Middlebrooks. Of ben Middlebrooks, Middlebrooks is so hard. It's unbelievable. He is like just straight out of white guy tournament central casting. Oh, yeah. Except for he's a post player. Yeah. It's like a throwback to the 80s. If you if you were to give that to Ben Middlebrooks, n nobody would bat an eye. You know what, though? You know what I started thinking? Because I saw the sprinkles on the ice cream. This, this could have been some co-branding opportunities. Sprinkles are for winners. Sprinkles are for winners. Just saying. In, in, a, in, the, in the world of NIL? The sprinkles are for winners, sprinkles man. Sprinkles are for winners. Let's, let's get that NIL going for NC State, even though uh, their trip in the tournament may not be uh, too long. long. <laughs> but they do have Oakland. I mean, they get Oakland because Coach Cal in the Kentucky Wildcats couldn't beat his own defense. They, they couldn't figure out that Oakland was playing a zone defense for like 20 minutes. It was <laughs> the most bizarre thing. Let's jump into that because really the upset of the day yesterday, Oakland knocks off Kentucky 80 to 76 and white lightning strikes all night. First is Rust with SportsCenter. No, no.
the Stadium Sports Bar and Grill. Uh, the women's tournament just got underway. We got an upset Bruin. We got an upset Bruin. Middle Tennessee State going to upset Louisville. Yeah, 34, 34 seconds to go. Louisville down five. Look at that. Now, looks like they just scored. Now down three Look with 28 that. seconds to go. Number four seed against an 11 seed. Oof. Look, that the 11 seeds on the men's side had a heck of a day yesterday. Yep. That's not something you see in the women's game really all that often. Nope. Uh, we saw biggest upset of the day yesterday, though, was Oakland knocking off the Kentucky Wildcats 80 to 76 yesterday in the opening round, a 14 seed knocks off the third seeded Wildcats and Oakland University, the Golden Grizzlies from Michigan, not Oakland, California. I think Indeed. a lot of people learned that yesterday. I feel like every time Oakland's in the tournament, everybody realizes that. Which is not very no, often, it's, it's, so it's easy yeah. to forget. It's, it's, it's like leap year. It's easy to forget, but the story of that game was 32 points off the bench from Jack Gokel. Gokel. Jack Gokel. The thing I love about the NCAA tournament, you get new verbs. You got Gokeled. Yep, you got Gokeled, and everybody's looking for a new nickname for him. I'm just dubbing him White Lightning because that dude is pure electricity. When he gets the ball in his hands, you know he's just shooting a three. He went 10 of 20 from three yesterday. What's the uh, what's the Lightning McQueen uh, sound? Kachow. Kachow. Yeah. That's, this that's that's what he was doing all last night was. Kachow, another three. He, 10 of 20 from three. And 10 of 20 from the field. Because that's all he does is shoot threes. He is. He only had eight shot attempts from two-point range on the entire season. And then what, 327 from three? He is like, like he is a <laughs> tourney darling. And he will be one of those guys that people remember in the NCAA tournament for years to come because he made his legacy. You come off the bench, you're the sixth man of the year in the Horizon League. You are, you knock off mighty Kentucky and John Calipari. Where they got how many how many draft picks do they got on that Kentucky team this year? Uh, in all likelihood, when it's all said and done, four, maybe five. And two of them are projected to be top, top five picks. Top, at least top ten for sure. In, in uh, Shepard and Dillingham. And Jack Gokel comes off the bench and sinks Kentucky. And like that is where legends are in the tournament are made. But I think the most fun part about Jack Gokel is I was all of a sudden you get in these deep dives on guys you've never heard of before from schools where you may not have known that they were even in Michigan. Yeah. And he was an average D2 player. He was an average D2 player. He went to Hillsdale College, his first three years of college, redshirted at the D2 level as a freshman. His, his first two years averages 6.7 points per game. <laughs> Good. As a redshirt freshman and a sophomore. He then pops his junior year, transfers, he's at Oakland, and he comes off the bench for the Golden Grizzlies and becomes a tournament legend. That is unheard of. Usually, like, these guys that you see make their way up through the ranks, they're guys that they There's, were studs at D2, and it was like, how, yeah. did, how did those guys get overlooked in the recruiting process? Yet the transfer portal allows them to, to transfer up, or you can get or a they free had transfer stuff up. stuff go wrong. Yeah. You know, you have some stuff that gets, ends up being a setback in life, but you get your stuff together. But because of, you know, your, your past transgressions, you're, you're stuck at maybe a lesser university. The crazy part about this, dude, like usually we see a story where it's uh, the big man from Boise State. His name's Cam Martin. Okay. Mm -hmm. His story went, he went to Jacksonville State. He transferred to Missouri Southern State, was a three-time D2 first-team All-American and then ends up transferring to Kansas and then transfers to Boise State, right? He was really good at D2, three-time All-American. Really stinking good player, right? That's not what this guy was. No. <laughs> no. And now he's going to be forever etched in NCAA history. That is awesome he to me. He did have a great line, though. He said, look, I know I'm not an NBA guy, but I know on any given night I can hang with those guys. And that's the thing is that's that's it. the beauty of the NCAA tournament is that the one and done nature of it is that anything can happen in a singular game. In that singular game, there are opportunities there that pop up that make you go, oh, didn't see that coming. Yeah. And him taking, again, he took 20 threes <laughs> by himself. Delano Banton just took notes and was like, he can, you, can, I, you can take 20? I'm going to go ahead and jot this one down here. 
And uh, on top of this, it took them, not only did Kentucky's offense not figure out how to break down Oakland's defense, the amount of time it took for them to realize this guy was never, ever, 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 ever taking anything other than a three and not trapping off screens no. and making him give the ball up. Look, I am not a blame the coach guy 99.9% .9 of the time. But for the love of God, you've got to make some change there. Well, there was they were jumping him on double teams, though, and he was still just shooting through them. Like, he was making everything. It was crazy to see. Like, Cal tried. He was way too late in doing it. He had seven threes in the first half. He made three in the second half. But it was like the dude... Was just, it was way too late. He'd already caught fire. When the, when a shooter like that gets into a rhythm and they have that can't-miss feeling and the bucket just looks ten times larger than it is, you're hooped. And that's what Coach Cal was, which begs the question now. Like, Kentucky fans are pissed. Like, there, there are people calling for Coach Calipari's head. Coach, Coach Cal. He has a $33 million buyout. And <laughs> there is offset language in his contract to where wherever he coaches next, that that $33 million can be offset in future salary. Uh-huh. But. What school is going to do that? Uh, what school is going to hire Coach Calipari? No, to offset him. Oh, I. but I think you're going to see a lot of teams are going to want him to coach sure right and then at that point it becomes a little bit of a bidding war but he's going to pick the place that he wants he wants I think to be it's, at. it's more about the place that he wants to be at as opposed to the money because because of the offset language or he's covered either way or they're going to kentucky's going to start trying to find cause to can him, <laughs> which we've seen before it'd be really funny if they're like hey you know we have all of this stuff from the uh late 90s early 2000s that we've been holding on to should we dump that now? <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna throw him under the bus and be the <laughs> sacrificial lamb. I have no idea what Kentucky does, but we again we've seen Texas A&M buy out Jimbo Fisher at seventy seven million dollars. We saw Gus Malzahn get bought out for twenty seven million dollars. Now that's football and not basketball. But what does Kentucky pride themselves on being? They are a basketball school. So if they really want to move on from Calipari, they're gonna find a way to do it. And this is – for is Coach Cal the best, most disappointing coach in basketball? Think of his track record. He's He has a national championship. Yep. He's been to Final Fours. He pumps out first-round draft 28 picks. 28 players currently in the NBA. A year and year again. Like, he's going to have two top ten picks this again year. this year. Yet, they disappoint – in the tournament and I know that one thing that rubbed a lot of Kentucky fans the wrong way with last night's result was Calipari continuing saying, to play we are still going to yeah. bring in freshmen look at all the good that we are doing by sending these guys to the NBA well Kentucky fans don't care that you're sending guys no. to the NBA they want to win they want Kentucky to win basketball games yes. because it does nothing for them to have a bunch of all-stars and a bunch of first-round picks if you're not winning games in the tournament yeah and that's the thing is uh, both uh, both NBA development programs G League Ignite and Kentucky both in, in a bit of shambles right now as they continue to prioritize young guys that may not be the answers I mean again last night DJ Wagner and and Edwards, Justin Edwards are out there, and the really the only reason that they're playing is because of who they are on a on a uh, draft evaluation board, and that's these are they're still starting because their recruiting rankings were higher. Reed Shepard and Rob Dillingham are better players and have been better players all season long. It's not even close. Okay, here is the last three Kentucky postseasons. I'll just go. Actually, I'll just go back and I'll just read you. Under Coach Cal, you tell me, is this a disappointment or not? Mm -hmm. Okay. This year, losing the first round. Yeah. Last year, losing the second round. Uh huh. 2022, losing the first round. Uh huh. 2021, did not make the tournament. Ooh. 2020, no postseason yeah, home. Yeah. 2019, Elite Eight. Okay. Then you go Sweet 16, Elite Eight. Second round loss, mm -hmm. final four, mm -hmm. national championship game loss, mm -hmm. NIT loss in the first round, Oof. national champions, yep. final four elite eight. I would say that he's fallen off a cliff in the last five years. You look at the how it started and where they are at now, 
the trend is you understand where Kentucky fans are. It's at this almost point. like NIL has made things easier for other teams in the level playing field. In leveling oh. the playing field. Well, and also, the, look at what's happening with the transfer portal. A lot of these teams that are winning games right now, they're getting guys through the portal they that are experienced. They get your seniors that have all you the know, experience look, in the world. Jermaine Cousnard, he yes. transfers in from Oregon. He drops 40 in the opening round. We were just talking about White Lightning from Oakland. He drops 32. He's a transfer, and he, he pops in, and he makes his mark in the NCAA tournament. Like, the portal and NIL have leveled the playing field, and it's not just in football where we're seeing, you know, Alabama fell victim to this too, right? And you have – And Georgia's – By the way, falling, sort of falling victim is going still going to college football. Yes, yeah, so the same thing with Georgia. But, I mean, they went from having – a roster that was two or three deep on both sides of the ball to those guys, you know, spreading around the country. And that's why I, I, I truly believe that it, it makes it that much more impressive what Rick Pitino is doing at all of his stops. Oh, right? you mean going everywhere John's. and winning? <laughs> <laughs> and finding a way to develop the talent and get in and build a winner. Now, St. John's didn't make the tournament this they year. Should have. St. John's didn't make the tournament this year, <laughs> but you saw how much growth in that St. John's team from when he's calling his team unathletic and not good at basketball, and then all of a sudden they catch fire and they go. When's the la we, the last time we saw that from a Kentucky team was 2000. 15? Sure. Final four. And remember, uh, where did Patino coach? At Kentucky. Oh, weird. That would be come full circle. The funniest thing ever if Rick Patino is the replacement for John Calipari. I'd laugh. Be because fun. then it makes sense for Patino because then he could stick it back to Louisville, which let him go. And there was that ri there, that rivalry is heated between yes. Louisville and Kentucky. And he's already been on both sides. But now if he bounces back to Kentucky. That's the chef's kiss right oh, there. Oh, no, you love that. And speaking of Louisville, uh, they have been upset on the women's side of the bracket. Middle Tennessee State pulls the upset. Look at that. So we've got a bracket buster, 11 seed in the women's side, causing issues already. All right. Love to see it. All right. Let's get it now. We have got uh, the NCAA tournament. We'll have a lot more on that as the day continues. Uh, we're going to keep you up to date on all the goings on around the NCAA tournament. But we may have seen exactly where one draft prospect wants to go next on the fan.
8. Big Lou will find a term life policy for you even if you have type 2 diabetes or overweight or have high blood pressure. Term provider has helped thousands of people like you. draft process that I can remember is that of one Marvin Harrison Jr., the wide receiver out of Ohio State, as Gus Johnson tried to push on us, Maserati Marv. Yeah. You can't make it work. He showed up at the Combine, which we'll give him a half a point for. Which, I mean... He did not do interviews, medicals, or workouts. I don't know why he was there. It's like putting your name on the SAT and turning it in. There we go. Yeah. You got the Derrick Rose of SATs. The Ohio State Pro Day, he did not participate in. He is not having his own personal pro day. Which, if you don't do the NFL one, and you don't do the school one, typically it's because you're going to go for the most controlled environment possible and, and have your own. In this, And he is not doing that. I, I'm assuming he will be forced to work out for teams when he does his top 32, which is your your visits to particular teams especially mm -hmm. first round draft prospects but we are maybe finding out a little bit about because everybody's like he's he must have a spot that he wants to go and he's trying to manipulate his landing spot and this one may be a bit of a surprise because uh, paris johnson jr arizona cardinals first round pick from a year ago said that he on a podcast called cardinals corner he called Marvin Harrison Jr. after he was drafted, and he said, you know you're going to be a Cardinal, right? Mm. And this was after DeAndre Hopkins had been traded. It was a void at wide receiver, and now you're starting to see, oh, they, they go out and not try to draft Marquise Hollywood Brown, re-sign him again. He ends up going to Kansas City. But this is before Hollywood Brown had even left. This is almost a year ago. He said... You're going to be a Cardinal, right? Because we need that stud receiver. Marvin Harrison Jr. a year ago said he wanted to be a member of the Arizona Cardinals. That is a preferred destination for Marvin Harrison Jr. They select fourth. Every single draft, mock draft that you can possibly see, if it doesn't have Arizona trading out, Arizona's taking Marvin Harrison Jr. The thing about this is I have a lot of questions, but most importantly, why? Why would you want to be an Arizona Cardinal? Why would you want to be an Arizona Cardinal? Nobody in the history of mankind has been like, you know where I want to be? Arizona with that program, with that ownership group, with everything is, is absolutely dysfunctional as an organization could possibly right. be. As he is growing up, think of the receivers that have come through there. Larry Fitzgerald. Sure. 
Anquan Bolden. Sure. Those are like formative years for Marvin Harrison Jr. His dad playing in the NFL. I don't know if there is a single like wide receiver or receiver coach that that does not say Larry Fitzgerald is exactly what you want to be as a receiver. Indeed. From a route runner, from the the fact the guy had more tackles than dropped passes in his still, career. That's still one of the most obscene <laughs> stats of all time. That's like the uh, the Joe Thomas holding calls. Yeah. He is. He was the epitome of what a, a number one wide receiver is: the ability to play inside, outside, kind of do everything. So Arizona, like in those formative years, they were in the forefront for Marvin Harrison Jr., where they're whipping the ball around with, you know, Kurt Warner and stuff. Maybe that is at play. I think the bigger factor here is that you actually have a one of these teams at the top of the draft, you actually have a quarterback that you know is serviceable. Whether you like Kyler Murray or not, you got to respect the fact that dude can sling it. And when he is healthy, he does play at a pretty high level. I don't like his, his personality um, as a leader. And as a, he's been kind of a malcontent at – well, everywhere he has been, <laughs> to be quite honest, whether that is Texas A&M, Oklahoma, the Oakland A's, or even at times with the Arizona Cardinals. But you have a good quarterback in a position where you're going to get drafted high. Usually you don't have a good quarterback to throw you the ball. That's obviously the, the thing that you kind of, I don't know, you accept <laughs> In a sense of like, yes, if you're going, if you're getting drafted top 10 as a, as a wide receiver, you're likely going to go to a team that has a dysfunctional quarterback or no quarterback, or they're trying to figure out the quarterback situation. And the thing is with Kyler Murray, the talent is there, but do you trust the organization? Do you trust Kyler no. Murray going forward? Do you, I mean, do you even look at that and go, uh, Larry Fitzgerald, I think is a one of one. I think the closest thing you can find in football is Mike Evans where he just shuts up and catches the ball. Incredible. All you ever hear about is great dude, wonderful human, does all the right things, first in, last out, never a problem. Like, how many wide receivers do we get a generation that are that guy? I One. don't think it's going to be Marvin Harrison Jr. And, and but. that's kind of my point. Like, And so he's going to go to that organization and put up with everything that's probably going to go on through his career there and be totally fine. I just, yeah. this feels like a match made in hell. I, I can't explain it, but I also understand what Marvin Harrison Jr. is trying to do. If he works out, he pops. He he is the guy that everybody is, is touting, you know, coming out of the combine. Then do you see maybe Washington or New England say, yeah, we'll we'll take the flyer on him, which I would have loved if New England would have done it, right? And if they would have traded for Justin Fields or they go out and, you know, get a quarterback in the second round, like if it's a Bo Nix or J.J. McCarthy or Michael Penix Jr., if one of those guys there, I would have loved that situation. But by not working out, not doing anything, he's pushing himself to the point where, all right, look, let's look outside of the top three. Number four is Arizona. You got a good quarterback there. Number five, the Chargers are, are drafting right behind there. Yeah. You got Justin Herbert, and on top of that, you've got Jim Harbaugh yeah. as your head coach. Now, that may go against there. him because he's a Michigan man. Uh, and in Marvin Harrison Jr. says maybe he just hates Michigan uh, so much he doesn't want to play for Jim Harbaugh. Anymore. He hates Michigan so much he doesn't want to win. Yeah, that, that, to down, me, that, that does seem like an Ohio State mantra after you getting beaten by Michigan like that. You are going to go, and Ohio State would be very quick to say uh, they couldn't beat us to save their lives for a decade before that. Though you know what I mean? It's fair, but I, I'm just saying, uh, Marvin never seen it. Yeah, you go down, and then you have the Giants, where Daniel Jones. I don't. I can't imagine he's high on him. Ryan Tannehill, or uh, excuse me, Will Levis in Tennessee is is right after that. Can't imagine he'd want to go there. And, but you do have DeAndre Hopkins, and I don't, they're not in the market for a wide receiver with Calvin Ridley and DeAndre Hopkins. And then you go Kirk Cousins in Atlanta with all the weapons there, and then Chicago. I mean, those are those are one through nine. Or you're playing for Aaron Rodgers if you torpedo yourself enough to get drop all the way down to tenth. I kind of understand what Marvin Harrison is juniors doing, but at the same time, it is very weird that even a year ago, Arizona was the place he wanted to be. Yeah, I'm still I'm I'm leaning I'm leaning heavily towards uh, uh I wasn't saying Diego game to Los Angeles here. If yeah. I can if I can finagle my way anywhere here. They need a receiver. They need a receiver. You've a got a, qu time. a quarterback you can trust significantly more, and a structure that you can trust significantly more. You still have ownership issues. There's real problems there. 
but you have the same thing in Arizona. So I, I don't know, man. I just there's nothing I've ever seen where I think anyone should be like, I want to be a Cardinal. Super weird. It's it really is. <laughs> it is a but bizarre. also that falls in line with Marvin Harrison, who has been yeah. super weird. Junior. All right. 503-864-6326. That's a Vancouver Ford Texan. We're down at Fan Madness. Brought to you by George McCoy at Warren Allen Attorneys at Law. In the a a Stadium Sports Bar. Hour number two. We start with a good day for the Pac-12. Next on The Fan.
Kathy and Dusty with you live at the Stadium Sports Bar in Alanay's Casino here. Everybody is, we get we get the rounds of applause going on. Games are going final. Marquette just walloped Western Kentucky that game. That was quite the second half. The, it was the surge, man. <laughs> Can, Marquette woke up, Shaka Smart and crew, knock off Western Kentucky 87-69 after being in a halftime nice. deficit. Yeah, down six and a half, and then to uh, come back and have a, uh, what, a 18-point win. Nice little 20, what, 24-point swing? Two and a half That's to go in, a bit. in the first half. UConn is the hatters of Stetson are just getting the doors blown Hey, thanks off. for coming, Stetson. 47 to 15. Yeah, and UConn's already resting, guys. They are loaded. Yeah, yeah. it's, uh, hey. Those payouts are the same. Hello. Doesn't matter if you uh, if you lose yep. by one or lose by hundred. In New Mexico, they may be the that next team, the the only eleven seed that's looking like they're going to lose at the break. They trail six seeded Clemson forty two to twenty eight in that ball game. Um, currently on on True TV right now, but uh, not very many games in hand. San Diego State survived. Um, a scare from UAB. UAB got a little hot in the second half, but uh, Brian Dutcher's crew, the the national runner-up from a year ago, holds on 69-65 over the Blazers of UAB in back. a 12-5 matchup. They are back. They're looking pretty good. So that's the action that we have yesterday. A great day for the Pac-12. Indeed. If you think, if you want to add the play-in with Colorado's win. They, the Pac-12 is now 4-0 mm -hmm. in, in the tournament. Now, I say 4-0 because we don't usually count the play-in sure. as anything. But for this purpose and the units that are given, it actually it means counts. a lot for yep. the Pac-12 conference. Um, you had now have with all four of those victories, Oregon blowing out uh, South Carolina yesterday with the Cougs rallying against Drake. That was a fun game, too. Yeah, it was. It uh, it felt like uh, the Cougs might Coug that thing. Drake closed the day as the uh, the favorite. Yep. The betting favorite in that, in that game. They had an eight-point lead over Washington State. And then the Cougs finally took a lead with 151 to play. And it was back and forth at the end, and the Cougs hold on, and they get a victory, and they hold, they're they dancing into the round of 32. Um, you have the Arizona shrugged off a, a slow start against Long Beach State, but flex, flexed their muscles and ran away with that one. Mm -hmm. Pac-12 goes 3-0 yesterday, which means that the Pac-12 is now up to $14 million for the Cougs and the Beavers to be paid out over the next six years. This goes to the Pac-2. You get you get units for every team that advances in the tournament. You get another unit. The Pac-12 is up to seven units now, with four teams making the field and three teams winning. If Colorado wins again, you're looking at another unit, and the Pac-12, the Pac-2 rather, is sitting pretty, man. Oregon State, it's gonna pain you. You gotta be rooting for the Ducks, the Buffs. In the Arizona Wildcats right now, because you're, of course you're going to root for Washington State sure. for Pac-2 pride, but you better hope that these teams make runs because that's more money in your pocket moving forward. I think that they're they're okay. I think they're okay doing so because the the, the the ties have been severed, right? It's it, it's just them and Washington State. It, there's no take backs. Mm -hmm. It's what's done is done. So now you you the switch has been flipped in the sense of. You, Washington State, Oregon State may have taken a little bit longer to do what was best for them. Yeah, I think they've reached that point now. Yeah. I think they've reached the yeah, sure, Ducks, go win. We just need money. Arizona, now. go win. Mm -hmm. Washington State, go win. Everybody, Colorado, go win. Woo! Yeah. Also, CTC, baby. Cut that check. Absolutely. Cut that check. Go, go the route of Rasheed Wallace and just CTC, baby, all day long. Unfortunately for the Cougs, I think they're going to run into a buzzsaw in the next one. They get Iowa State in the next round. They are scary good. But here's the thing with Kyle Smith teams. They're just going to muddy that thing up. And if they are within striking distance, who's going to sit there and say Washington State's going to be out of it? Because how many ugly games where they just make the other team, they drag the other team into deep water where they don't want to be, and they find a way to win the ball game? That is what the Washington State Cougars do. It's going to be a tall order against Iowa State tomorrow. 
but they've got a, a, a decent little matchup. I think Oregon playing Creighton. I think that's going to be a fun game. You know, the the Ducks as an 11 seed, they get the third seed to Creighton Jays, who uh, knocked off Akron 77-60 yesterday. Uh, tomorrow, that's going to be a really fun game. I have no earthly idea which direction that game goes because Creighton – is, has been good enough at points in the year. They knocked off UConn earlier this season. They're one of the three losses for UConn is against the Creighton Jays. Creighton is a team that has legitimate scoring, and they can beat you from all over the floor, and they are a team that can get dumb hot from three. And that's the thing about – we haven't really seen that yet here from a tournament team where a team just went, hey, we're, we're going to drop I – mean, we had one guy at Oakland bomb ten threes on you, but we haven't had a team – Holy catch fire and go, hey, uh, what happens if we shoot 49% as a team from three on high volume? Yeah, well, I think what we saw from Oregon yesterday, it was an outlier from what we've seen. From Oregon, in, specifically, in, yes. In, in the recent memory. But the Ducks and, and Jermaine Cousinard, who caught fire, and he drops a 40 spot yesterday. But they're 7 of 16 from 3. They have 7 total 3s. And but it's you don't need it doesn't matter when Kustard goes 5 for 9, right? I no. mean in that that is where I said this leading into the tournament. Oregon needed Jermaine Kustard to to show up because you can't just rely wholly on Infali Dante to to lead you. You're going to need guys like Jackson Shellstead to just be the steadying hand. You're not you know what you're getting from Kwame Evans. You have to get the best shot out of Kusnard. And his former teammate calling him out yesterday, apparently there's two guys on South Carolina's roster that played with uh, Jermaine Kusnard that, that still remain. Mm -hmm. One of them hit a three early on him, and he let him know about it. Yep. And Shellstead and Infali Dante said after the game, that is the wrong person to mock, even if it's lovingly and jokingly because they were friends. Locked and Kusnard was his, his mentor. They said that was the jumping off point for Kusnar to just go nuclear on South Carolina. Hopefully somebody is dumb enough to do that for Creighton because if he if you have two hot hands and you can ride in Folly Dante, which the monster of efficiency he was again yesterday. Continues to do it. The guy is a man on fire. 85% in the month of March. He's shooting eight, and it's continuing. What he's doing is absolutely insane. He goes for 23. Shellstead gives you his 11 points. Evan, you get eight out of him. That is what you need. You need those two guys to truly show up because that has been the bugaboo with this Oregon Ducks team is consistency, right? Yeah, but the thing is we've seen so much consistency of them in that Pac-12 tournament run and now an NCAA tournament game. Yeah, the thing you really have to worry about if you're Oregon is Baylor Shireman. Uh, him going out there and bombing threes on you. The other one is in, in the most Creighton Midwestern name is, is Ryan Kalkbrenner, who's a seven foot one, two hundred and seventy pound kid. That's 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 a lot of that's a lot of size to deal with. Yeah. Uh, he will step out and occasionally take some threes, but he it's those two guys that are going to kind of be the anchors. But yeah, Shireman is a fifth year senior. Spent three years at, at uh, South Dakota State. Is in year two now at Creighton. He is a guy. He's he's going to end up in the NBA. Yeah. He's going to be an old NBA guy, but he's going to be a guy that probably is a fringe guy beyond a ten day. I, I I can see him sticking in the league and get a couple contracts, kind of a deal. He's just a heady player, six foot seven, jack of all trades type. That uh, the the professional basketball player type. And those are the kind of guys who there's. Doesn't matter if you junk it up defensively, if you throw two at him. They've seen it all in college basketball. And with those opportunities to present themselves, they just find a way to win. And that's kind of been Creighton's calling card this entire year. The revenge tour that Oregon uh, is seeing in this. Yet Kusnard with South Carolina. Mm -hmm. Dane Altman's playing his former team, there the Creighton go. Jays, in round two. I don't think we got a connection to Texas or Tennessee uh, if they are able to advance tomorrow into the Sweet 16. But. One thing that you can't deny, how about Dana Altman, man? There are people, like, questioning whether he should be the coach of the Oregon Ducks after this year. I mean, he was, there were quiet. discussions around college basketball that he was going to step away. Uh, no. I mean, and he even said that he's not, he wasn't going to step away. And Oregon wasn't going to fire him. He, he's taken them to Final Fours. He's been a consistent coach. This year was plagued by injuries. 
they're finally getting a little bit more healthy and you're getting that consistency from your young bucks and the old guys stepped up. Dana Altman, 8-0 all-time in the first round of the NCAA tournament. It's a good number to be. 8-0 all-time. It's better than, uh, what, 9-21, Rick Barnes? That is crazy. Yeah. Get there and you're successful. And he is a damn good coach that his, he gets his teams peaking at the end of every season. All right, 503-864-6326. That's a Vancouver Ford Texan. We had a really interesting question uh, posed to us on Twitter. I think we could, we, we could jump into that. Yeah. Next on The Fan. It's the fan on demand. With whole show podcasts. I, I appreciate you because we needed a hamster to pedal this wheel around. <laughs>
All right, we were posted a question on Twitter by Zachary Jeans. And I like this Twitter question. We get the NCAA tournament going on right now. He asked, would the eligible trailblazers who technically could still be in college dominate the NCAA men's basketball tournament? The answer is yes. Yeah, I think you could have some pretty good players there. Uh, Chris Murray would be a senior. And he averaged, what, 27 a game last year at Iowa? Yeah. I Ryan Rupair would dominate college basketball. Yeah, six foot nine, hyper twitchy athletic wings. Uh, could put the ball on the floor, knock down threes, and kind of create a little bit. And he, he would be a sophomore in college, right? He, God, he might even be a freshman. Yeah, he's a young buck. He's young, man. He's a young buck, but uh, he would be he would be a great one. Uh, I, I mean, we think of this in, like, all of the knocks that Scoot Henderson has. Scoot Henderson Scoot would, would be a terrorist. He would dominate <laughs> in college basketball. He would be a sophomore in college, and so I think that he would be insane. And it wouldn't be like he'd be filling it up for, you know, 40 points, 35 points, but he would just be the nuisance that nobody could get around defensively, and he'd be a yeah. problem for guys to stay in front of. And not only that, the problem that he has right now is that in the NBA, guys are bigger, stronger, faster, smarter. So when he gets into the paint, he can't use his athleticism to when he picks up the ball at the free throw line. You can do that in college. You yeah. can do that in the G League. You can't do that in the NBA. The only guys who can pick up the ball at the free throw line consistently and score at the rim at the guard position are the Russell Westbrooks in his prime, the John Morants, the Derrick Roses. You have to be the .0001% athletic, the ability to put a foot in the ground and jump over a seven-footer. In college, you don't have to worry about that. You play like two seven-footers a year. Yeah. So it's like the one the one pushback I think would be is that the spacing in college is worse. Yeah. But that means if you are able to drive and kick and spray the ball out, the opportunity you have if you're playing on a team with shooters means you're creating opportunities early and often. Boy, Jabari Walker is Eligible. only 21. Yep. He would be he would be a monster. He would be so damn good. Like, the, the question, and I think, like, this goes back to, like, everybody's like, ah, oh, you know, the worst team in the end. The Carolina Panthers would lose to Michigan. No, they wouldn't. The Carolina Panthers would absolutely destroy the Michigan Wolverines in a football game because every single player on Carolina's roster was one of the best players on their college team. <laughs> there, are, there are a lot of guys on, that played for the national champion Michigan Wolverines football team that will not play in the NFL. Every single player on the Carolina Panthers plays in the NFL. Yes. Same thing can be said for the NBA. Blazers are not a great NBA team. No. They would, even if you just said, our college eligible, our college age players, we're just going to only play them, they would dominate in the NCAA tournament. Yeah, I mean, think about this here real quick, all right? Okay. Tamani Kamara with the Portland Trail Blazers only averages a handful of points, right? It's just, it's a, it's a, it's a simple time. Okay, well, his last year at Dayton, he was 14-9-2 with one and a half steals. He shot 55% from the floor. He shot 61% from two. And he shot 36% from three. Is he doing that in the NBA day one? No. No. No, because he, as you progress, as you get older, as you get smarter, as you get bigger, as your body matures, all of these things start to kind of come together and allow you to turn into a, something from a prospect to an actual NBA player. Yeah. And that's really the process you're seeing guys go through. And that's unfortunately for Kentucky's Reed Shepard and, and uh, Rob Dillingham, they both were dog water yesterday. They were bad. Now, Coach Cal did not put them in the best positions to be successful. But at the same time, you're also your players need to make plays. Yeah. And neither one of them showed up. And that's just kind of how that goes sometimes. But a lot of that has to do with how young guys are. We talk so much every single year, every single year of the, the, the existence of the NCAA tournament. A team with veteran presence, with older players, makes a run, and everyone's, how did this team get here? And you're like, oh, their entire roster is made up of seniors. <laughs> no way. And it's like, yeah, well, yeah, that's why. Well, look at, I mean, Oregon's run is a good example of this. In Folly Dante, fifth-year senior. Jermaine Cousnard, senior. You have to have the vets 
in order to to advance in the NCAA tournament. We we see it every single year. We saw it last year with UConn. Saw it last year. Well, just, hell, just look at the Final Four last year. Final yeah. Four: UConn, San Diego State, Florida Atlantic, uh -huh. and Miami. Uh -huh. All of them veteran-led teams. Oh, just loaded to the gills, yeah. and we're surprised. Oh my God, Coach Cal's out of the tournament yeah. again with eight freshmen. You know what my favorite part of Kentucky losing mm. to Oakland yesterday was? What? Mike Slive's comments. Mike Slive, who said uh, that, remember, Mike Slive has always been on this, where it is like, well, we may just break off and do our own thing. We'll make our own tournament. We need more bids for power conference teams, less bids for the smaller schools. Well, guess what? One of those small schools from the Horizon League just sent your SEC team packing. That's womp, the womp, beauty womp. of the NCAA yeah. tournament. I don't want to see 96 teams. No, it's just right. I, we have a really... I don't need more Virginia's. They just <laughs> want to mess with perfection. Yeah. And that's my whole thing with, yep. like, whether it's St. John's or Seton Hall complaining to get in. There's 68 teams that get in, for yep. God's sakes. We're okay right here. The thing is, they did get it wrong, and that's fine. But that's, that's fine. part of the process. And like, uh, that, that, that imperfection breeds perfection. Because then you get some of these games that, you know, you wouldn't have otherwise. But on the flip side, yeah, we don't need 96. We, we, no. it's, it's, it's nice the way that it is. We don't. It's, I don't need to watch more Virginias. I don't need to watch more Colorado State score 11 points in the first half. I don't need any of that. We had Duquesne beat BYU. We had an A-10 team beat a Big 12 team. We had a Horizon League team beat an SEC team yesterday. I'm I'm here for I'm here for the little guy to finally get some right like the little guy to win it's so much damn fun in the NCAA tournament so that was like a nice little uh, little jab to the SEC and all everybody who's who's running the SEC to we're gonna break off and make our own con make our own tournament if if all of our teams aren't getting it. no some of your teams don't belong and guess what White Lightning just sank. A team with two top ten picks yesterday, and that's awesome. To me. Do you want to feel old real quick? Yeah. Joel Mashburn Jr. is currently the line for New Mexico. Yeah. Playing for Rick Patino's kid. <laughs> Jamal Mashburn Jr. Junior, Rick playing Patino. for Rick Richard Patino. Rick Patino. Okay. Yeah. That's that's the world we're in, baby. It's tough. Yeah. Life comes at you fast. Or in chunks of 20 years at a time. Either way, coming up next, we're going to have today's worst day on the web. And you know what? Sometimes you just take things and you think, ah, you know, I got away with that. It's totally okay. I should continue to do that over and over again until I get caught. Wait, no, that's not the way this works. But first, is Mick Delano, the Sports Center update. That's that Hawaiian burger joint. Now, now, from the Fan Sports Day.
today's worst day on the web with Danny and Dusty on Odyssey and 1080 The Fan. Man, that sucks. Wouldn't we all love to live in a world where gasoline was free? Yes. Wait, yes. Yeah, right? Yeah. A woman in Lincoln, Nebraska found, uh, you know, I, you know, you go on social media, life okay. hack. Yeah. She found a life hack. Uh, well, turns out it wasn't exactly a life hack. She went to a pump and pantry in Lincoln, Nebraska. Wait, hold on. There's a place called Pump and Pantry? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Shout out the Midwest, baby. <laughs> Pump and pantry. Uh -huh. I love this. All right. So uh, she found that if she double scanned her card. Okay. It's a rewards card. It would make the gas free. Life, life hack, right? Yeah. Think how much more money you have if you don't have to spend money on gasoline every month. So much more. She did it for $28,000 worth. Whoa. Life hack. Life hack. Wait, how did they find this? How did she end up getting caught? Well, I mean, the gas station would look at it and go, huh. Because there's, you know, there's, there's scales that, you know, weigh the gas. And you yeah. have, even though gas comes in at different prices, buying and selling, it knows how much is in the tank when a different price comes in. So at the end of the month, you know exactly how much money you should have made based on weight sold during or gallon sold during yeah. periods. And all of a sudden, it's just off. It's off. It's off. It's off. It's off. And now they go back through. They watch the tape. And hello. It was one lady. They were able to narrow it down to one lady. And okay. How much was she filling up for? $28,000 over. What is our time period? That Pumping she... gas from multiple occasions from November 22nd until June 1st of 2023. Okay. That, so six months? Like that's uh, where seven months, mm -hmm. something like that. That is that's a ton of gas. She spent twenty eight thousand. Now I bet you once she figured this hack French. out, she was just like, "Hey, I got this. Check this out. Watch this." And she was bringing everybody down to go and do the exact same stuff. I can't tell you how thrilled I would be, but you know what? There's no way. Like, are are they gonna come after her, sue her? Are they just like, "You got us on this one, no more"? Because so it's it, their fault. It gets better though. She did do it for somebody else, but she allowed to want another woman to use her card for a fee. Oh, so, no. So she was paid $500 for $700 worth of gas. Wow. I mean, all told, the card was used. So it was 510 only... times. <laughs> More than 7,400 gallons of gas were pumped for free. <laughs> You know what? Like, I feel bad for, like, the local owners of the pump and pantry there yeah, in, yeah, they're, in they're, Nebraska. They're getting screwed over. That's a small mom and pop. Yeah, they're getting screwed over. But, like, I mean, everybody is sitting there, and we're all thinking the same thing. Like, hell yeah, I would do the exact same thing if I had it. So it was only her card. So anybody else that had the rewards card at the pump and pantry, it, it this hack was not working for. It was just some defect in her card no, alone. No, if, if by double scanning, because nobody else is okay, going well, to why, do it. Why, did, why didn't the lady that gave her $500 just get her own pump and pantry card? Probably didn't, probably didn't know the secret sauce. Oh, man. Or she went with her, did it. And was like, hey, you need to pay me for this. You know. Yeah, a little sum for the ever. I got you this know. I got this hack here. Let me let me whip my right. beak. So they coming after her in court or what? Oh, yeah, What's no, she's, going she's on? Go, she's been arrested for theft. Grand, she, oh, grand theft. Whoa. $28,000. $28,000. That's you, a steep price that's there. That's uh, felony theft charges. Oh, boy. Yeah, you cross the 5000 Look, uh, it depends on where you are in the country, but usually five grand is the cutoff for look, the, old, uh, the old theft line. They don't want me on that jury because I'm going – I, I'm I'm the one hanging that thing up. Like the the get the pump and pantry does not want me on that jury right there, because I'm sitting there. I'm staring down gas prices are too, and I'd be like, God, no, I'm gonna I'm I'm, I'm letting her walk on this one. My humble opinion. Wow. I'm a, yeah, I'm gonna let her walk on this. Really? It's the pump and pantry's fault. You had the defective cards there. Agreed. So they're, they're, they wow, have no both of you no culp no culpability on the pump and pantry. They don't know that the ha that the problem exists. Well, it's not my fault. Not her fault. She clearly took advantage it's of not, it. Yeah, she did. Wow. Yeah. You two are the last two people I want to be near. Like if the world ever falls apart. Why? Because you guys are gonna like take advantage of people. 
No. Yeah. yeah. No, this is no 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 no. <laughs> yeah. No. Jeff it, well, Neely. hold on. If the yeah. world if the world is falling apart, yes, one hundred percent. You're right, you're correct. I'm taking advantage of folks. It's survival of the fittest when the world is falling apart or crashing around you. But we live in we we're not in that if, world right now. If we don't if the world falls apart and we don't care for each other, who will, Dusty? Who will? I don't care. I don't know. Your I mom. am the voice of reason on your this. Mom. How is this yeah. possible? I don't I'm know. surprised Danny is the uh, has the support of big government here or supporting big yeah. government. Big business. Whoa, 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 whoa. I'm supporting oil the mom tycoon. And pop. Oil tycoon Danny the, Meringue look, over look, here. We can screw over OPEC. I'm, look, but I, I this think all I comes down to over OPEC, this all okay? comes this all comes down to gas prices for me. <laughs> And I, I'm looking. I'm always looking for a bargain. Uh, oh, God! Both of you are just disgusting individuals. Well, yeah, we already knew that, though. I'm, I, I see no. I, I see nothing wrong here. Wow. Again, I'm fine. I'm fine for this woman. Uh, they don't want me on that jury. They do not want me on that jury. This, yeah. Is this it, something that I would do? I'm like, hello, I know if I was kettle, you're black. If I was, uh, if I was at the, like. There would be a point if I had this life hack where I wouldn't be telling anybody about it. I, I think that she did go too far in that regard of just, like, charging folks for it and manipulating it that way. But so what you're saying is that you would go and you'd be like, go to the pumping pantry and be like, hey, by the way, I'm, I'm getting free gas. You would do that? Yeah. You would? Yeah. No, you wouldn't. I would. No, you wouldn't. I would. No, you wouldn't. I know, I know you. You would not do I that. I would. No. No, I would. Yeah. I don't. I don't see that happening. It might go a few times, but I would. See? Uh, no, uh, uh. see My I guilt would, would overcome me if it got too far. That's but what I mean. Well, it's yeah. like I, I'm sitting here and I'm telling you right now. On the, here, here's the thing. On the first one, I probably wouldn't notice. That's on them. I would just start, you know, uh, start a pumping and walk yeah. away. Yeah. Good for good for her to get free gas for that long. I mean, 510 times. That's a little excessive. That's over, a lot of pumping. From November to June. That's an eight-month period. Yeah, stretch. I, I couldn't pump eight that months. much over six months. Yeah, and at what point did the and, – and here's why I'm deciding with her, too. The pumping pantry, when you're going 510 months over – or 510 times over eight months, how are they not being like, why are you here so much? Why are you always here getting gas? Yeah. So you're like, she's but a regular you, at but that. But I guess point. if you show up in a, in, with a different card, Dude, or a different car. But that that is beyond the point of you sit there and you're like, five hundred and ten times over an eight like, month period. Like twice a, more than twice a day. Yeah. And they weren't like, hey, you're back again. Yeah. How are you driving this much? It's impossible. Even if you have multiple cars, that makes it even more difficult to use that much gas. So, again, don't put me on this jury because I'm going to be like, you guys didn't notice that she was coming through twice a day for eight months in a row? <sighs> <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. I feel like you notice when come through comes through and pumps more than twice a day. <laughs> yeah. You know. You would notice. No, I don't know. Yeah. All right. Uh, coming up next, a little bit of NFL news. The uh, Keenan Allen situation not ending on uh, the the brightest of notes uh, with with the Los Angeles Chargers. As your uh, some back and forth between the general manager now and Keenan Allen's agent, uh, setting the story straight here on Danny and Dusty tonight. The fan.
Los Angeles Chargers wide receiver Keenan Allen, formerly, I should say, of Los Angeles. Uh, now the Chicago Bears wide receiver Keenan Duh. Allen. Bears. Uh, that was a relationship you thought maybe ended a bit more amicably considering the history and, and long tenure and success that Keenan Allen had there as an individual player. Outside of his injuries, he's one of the most successful wide receivers the organization has probably ever had. 10,000 yards. Yeah, I mean, he's a hell of a player in their story, in their in their franchise's story. Well, you heard Keenan Allen when he signed with the Bears. Uh, he was asked at his introductory press conference about how things kind of went down with, with the Chargers and whether or not it was a situation in that uh, he was willing to take a pay cut. And he said, no, flat out. It was about the money. And I... You know, I wanted to play, be played market value, and that's why I ended up being traded. Paid some on his money. Which, yeah. Uh, however, uh, Chargers, General, Chargers general manager Joe Hortz, uh, Hortiz uh, said the team presented multiple different options to Keenan Allen before Keenan Allen's ultimate trade request. You see, this is, what, this is why we heard in his introductory press conference in Chicago, like, uh, no, I'm not restructuring my deal. I'm not. I, I yeah. want my money. Yes. In it, I am. I, I I see this from both sides. Truly see this from both sides. The Los Angeles Chargers were forced to restructure deals because Tom Telesco, for as much talent as he was able able to acquire, it can't do he ruined their books for them entering this year. So you have a new GM, a new head coach coming in. They need to get their books right so they can be a build a contender and a winner. You couldn't do it with the way the contracts were structured. No. So I get it from the Chargers side of going to them with multiple offers saying, hey, we can do this, we can do this, we can do this. It's a lot of money that's going to be shifting around for you, though, Keenan. And I understand from Keenan Allen going, no, I want my damn money. I'm coming. In, I'm in the twilight of my career. I know I don't have much tread left on my tires. Yeah. I want my damn money. I get both ends of this. And I think that the Chargers are, threw him a bone by sending him to the Bears, too. Because I think they, that they were going to trade deal. him to one of two teams. The Bears was not on that list. The interesting thing about this is Joby Brandon, who's uh, Allen's agent, said, uh, to be clear, only one offer was made. It was a pay cut for this year with a two-year extension. And both years had even deeper cuts to his current pay. We made a counter His oh Wait, hold on. His annual pay or his guaranteed money? Like, this is agenting right C here. Because uh, what I assume the Chargers were doing, they were saying, hey, we can have a two-year extension where you, the money that you're going to be getting this year, we're going to guarantee over those next two years. But... We are going to, the base salary is going to be down over those next two years, which I also understand from the Chargers side. And I totally get them saying, go take a hike on that. Yes, exactly. Because that's the whole point of, Keenan Allen had restructured his deal previously, twice, I believe. Now, after they made their counter offer and it was rejected, they, being uh, Brandon and Allen, were then informed that the Chargers' intention was going to be to trade it. Basically, yeah. the Chargers drew a line in the sand and they said, if you're not willing to take X, we're out. There, were, there, there, there was no negotiation okay. that took place here. But this it, was, we know the, the, the line that we can go to, and if you're not willing to go to that line, brother, but we're out. Brother, $60 million over the cap or whatever it was, mm -hmm. like they had to draw those lines. And they did it with Cleo Mack. They did it with Joey Bosa. Yeah. But And th those two guys, good soldier. But also, Bosa got guarantees and a date change to his while also being younger. Cleo Mack has been paid multiple times, and he got his guarantee pushed up. So there was opportunities for, also for them to earn the money back uh, very quickly huh. and very painfully for the Chargers if it did come to fruition. Both of these are going to be one-sided, trying to manipulate the narrative from, from both sides of this. And they both have ground to stand on. Yeah. But the difference here is that you're operating with a new general manager. If this is Telesco... It probably doesn't go down this way. Yeah, because Telesco screwed him financially. <laughs> but, but not just that, but like the relationship. This yeah. is what happens uh. when it's not your guy. Yeah, yeah. And Telesco did screw them financially, but I believe every GM screws their team. They were gearing up for a run, and they, and they had to it, do it. it falls yeah. off. The yeah. 49ers are hitting that right now. The yeah. Patriots are paying for Dolphins. it still. The Dolphins are paying for it this season. You essentially have a two, maybe three-year window to operate before financially it's going to punch yeah. you in the face. And the big problem that I have with Tom Telesco, though, is that he put all his eggs in unproven basket, right? We're talking about the teams that 
do it right and they open up that they keep that winning window open they are successful and then they do everything they can to keep that window open mm -hmm. that's new england that's kansas city yep. and what kansas city's doing right now miami and la what they did and, and i'll give the rams credit for this too i'll put them in that new england They're and, in a and kansas spot city than any, than anybody expected them to be. they they kicked that can down the road mm -hmm. and they tried to now you always have to you know pay the piper at some point but the chargers and the dolphins did it on the if yep if we get man as a fan you, you, you love see. you yes. love that you do it like you have that willingness to push all in because you're not going to get there without a little bit of risk but the amount of money that both of those teams tied into those runs it was a bit head scratching because you were paying guys that were injury prone mm -hmm. a ton of money you knew it but it the Rams never got that though, too. I think yeah. the Rams did that too if you look at Stafford Stafford was a guy that has been beat up throughout his career. You look at the wide receiver core, the guys that have been beat up in their careers, all the guys that they brought in for the fill out the roster run down the stretch were big time risks. Yeah, but but they did pay off. But hold on, Stafford was also an upgrade. They, Over they golf, those certainly. risks, it wasn't you upgraded that position and then like Odell Beckham he worked out tremendously until, until he his, tears his ACL his in the Super Bowl. Yes. In the Super Bowl, yep. though. And that's when the that's when the injuries started piling up for, for Odell in that regard. Like, they, they upgraded their rooms. The Chargers were like, well, he's hurt, but you know what we're going to do? Reset the market with him. Yeah. <laughs> The flip side uh, being, when Keenan Allen is on the field, he's so good. He's one of the best wide receivers so in the league. Yeah. And that's how you put up 10,000 yards. You're damn right. Playing for the Chargers. It's yep. just, it's a very interesting. Yeah, Keenan Allen is not one of those guys that I, I don't think they overpaid him no, at all. No. But no he, Even though he he's missing four it. games a year with a hamstring injury, he's an absolute stud. Dude, those, those other 12 to 13 games that he's on the field for them, he was electric and it's a game changer. 10 to 12 catches every game. On every route, Dude, eating guys up. 1,200 yards this year. <laughs> there was a stat floating around the internet that popped up. Oh, I'll believe it then. The internet's was, never lied to me. Right? Uh, I, I did double check it. So it was last week. It was something about Keenan Allen, the record of games with 10 plus catches. He kept breaking it. Like, Keenan Allen has this record for this many games with 10 straight catches and yeah. this many games. It's like you went through the list. It was Keenan Allen, <laughs> Keenan Allen, Keenan Allen, Keenan Allen, Keenan Pretty Allen, good. and Keenan Allen. And it was just 10 plus catch games over and over and over again. More. And that's the kind of thing is it's when you when you get to this point in your career, you can make a decision. Do you want the money, the guaranteed money? Yeah. Or do you want to go ring chase? And I I think if you're going to Chicago Bears, you're very clearly not ring chasing. <laughs> no. No, you're, no, you're but he, not. But on the flip side, he restructured in his prime years for a team that was trying to win. Yeah. So he maybe did the uh, the inverse yeah. of it all. Well, he, he trusted the direction that they were going in, and you don't fault him for that because they went from Phil Rivers to Justin Herbert. And it's pretty two pretty damn good quarterbacks that he's played with. Kind of crazy when you think about that. It's it's Green Bay esque, but it doesn't get I think the same kind of shine because obviously the lack of Winning. playoff success and Super Bowl appearances and yeah. wins and MVPs and making the playoffs. Yeah, those things. Yeah. All right, coming up next, there's a ton of changes in basketball, both in the NBA and at the developmental levels. Scoring down, recruiting all over the place, and developmental programs being scrapped. Coming up here on Danny and Dusty, 10 the Fan.
but live on location at the Stadium Sports Bar and Grill at A. Lene Resort and Casino. It is a wonderful day here for all of the hoops, men's and women's games. Currently underway, Colorado, Florida, currently in a tight one, seven seed against a 10 seed, 28-24. Seven minutes to go here in the first half. New Mexico and Clemson seems to be opening up a little bit of a gap. And Auburn struggling with Yale. Are we going to get an Ivy League upset sneaking into the uh, into the bracket here? That would be back-to-back -back years because last year, remember, Arizona lost to Princeton. Indeed. It would also ruin my bracket because I have Auburn as a national title winner. Uh-oh. Uh, sweating it a little bit. <laughs> ah, they're fine. Hour Still a lot of basketball to play. They're, they're, they're just under the halfway point of the first half. Indeed. It is hour number three here on Danny and Dusty, whether you're listening on 1080 AM, watching on YouTube.com backslash 1080 AM the fan, or twitch.tv backslash 1080 AM the fan, or if you're here live and on site. We appreciate you. We love you. Uh, come down and hang out with us. Uh, after we get done, Isaac and Sook will be going from 3 to 7 p.m., and all of the March Madness action will be going on. You can also join us coming up September 2nd at Moda Center, Def Leppard Journey. Enter now. You can text DEF. That's DEF as in Def Leopard to 503-846-6326 to be entered to win and have a chance to go see Def Leopard and Journey September 2nd at Moda Center. When these tickets go on sale, it's going to be hysteria. Dun, 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 dun. Pouring sugar on them. Are, are we? Are we? Are don't we stop at, believing if you don't win. Are we at butt rock levels with those two? Def Leppard for sure, right? Def Leppard for sure, not Journey. Not Journey? No. Yeah. No, definitely not Journey. So it's, it's, a, it's a half a butt rock. That's right. There you go. That's right. But a, but a, hell, of a, a hell of a time. I bet you that's, I honestly, I honestly, honestly believe that's probably a really good show. Yeah, I bet it is. Right? Yeah. Oh, you know what wasn't a good show today? You know what mm. I, what team is really bothering me? What's that? See South Carolina women? No. What happened? Good teams win, great teams cover. Oh, did they not cover? No. No, oh, they no. didn't. They only won 91 to 39. Oh. And they didn't they didn't cover. Wait, the what? line on that game was 55 and a half. Was anybody actually taking that line? <laughs> they beat them. They played Presbyterian in a 16-1 matchup. They won 91 to 39 and failed to cover that game because earlier in the year they beat Presbyterian by 60. Oh, God, they had them in their non-con, huh? They had them in the non-conference, beat them by 60, Goodness. and 91 to 39 is not even close to, to cover. Well, they were three away. But uh, great great teams cover in the South. The fighting Don Staley's failed to cover today. That's truly it's a knock. amazing and disgusting at the same time. Yeah. I, I, this is the kind of information that I... Uh, they will sit with me forever and haunt me. Yep, there you go. Can't cover 55? Cowards. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. Well, speaking of cowards, the NBA is folding up the G League. Ignite, I should say. Not the G League. The Not G League the G Ignite. League as a whole, but the no, G the League team. Ignite. And the this is such a, I mean, this is a, a smart move. Now, when the G League Ignite was formed, I thought it was brilliant by the NBA. It was a really good move in order to develop talent. Now... That was li quite literally, it was the year before NIL became legal, wasn't it? That the Ignite started? Uh, two years before. Two years before? Yeah. Once NIL became an option for college athletes, the G League Ignite all of a sudden became obsolete. And as hard, they tried to spin it and say, well, we're developing professionals. Which, to an extent, I will say that was the idea. But so is every major college. Uh, I would argue some of them are significantly better at it than others. And, yeah. that's, and that's the thing is that the G League Ignite was going to focus on that. It, the re, let's be honest. The returns of the G League Ignite were not anywhere close to what they were expecting them to be. No. From player development, no. from grabbing the t truly the top talent in, in the high school levels and getting them to... Uh, I, where are they even based out of? They were in Vegas for a, a minute. Where are they? Where's the Ignite based out of now? Is it in Ontario, California? Yes. Down in Southern California? Yes, I believe. They weren't nearly as successful as they thought because NIL it pulled those kids back to college, which I think is a good thing. And, you know, because for every guy that goes and plays one year in the Ignite and then is able to jump to the NBA – 
there's a couple of guys that would actually benefit a lot from playing a couple of years in college. You know, they were, they were in Vegas. They, they were they, they were in Walnut Creek, and they moved yeah. to Henderson. That's what it was. Okay. Oh, so they went from California to Nevada. to Henderson, Nevada. Yeah. Uh, it, it it wasn't all that they thought it would be, or all that it was cracked up to be. The guys who who went there and and were able to play um, those two years prior to. Mm-hmm. You know, NIL, more power to him. But, like, look, Scoot Henderson's here in Portland. It, he didn't come out of the G League a more polished product than he would if he would have gone to, I mean, I don't know which program you would point if he went to Kentucky, mm-hmm. right? Like, I mean, I think he and Shaden Sharp kind of both went different routes, but the same result yes. of they're still young and raw and you see all of the pieces for and them. And both were shut down. And, and both were shut down in, in those respective mm-hmm. paths that they took. I mean, it, it didn't change. It didn't no. change really anybody. How, how many guys changed their lot in the order of the NBA draft because they played for the Ignite as opposed to going to – and these are all guys that would play at Kentucky, UConn, national powerhouses. I think Scoot did because he started playing with the Ignite two years ago. Yeah. Because he played there for two years. So I think that did help him in that vein. The thing about this is, the uh, the Ignite, in theory, was a good idea, even with NIL. The problem is human nature takes course. And for those that are unfamiliar, the Ignite roster was supposed to be a group of high-level prospects, two to three of them, like top five guys. Then you were going to have guys that were trying to make the league. So you'd have some competitive balance. And then you'd have some sage veterans that have no ifs, ands, buts, thoughts about going to back yeah. to the NBA. They are there to help mentor young kids. And you had that with Pooh Jetter. You had that with Amir Johnson. You had that with even this year with John Jenkins, who has helped out with, with the Olympic team on the select side. What you didn't have is you had Norris Cole who's yeah. trying to make his way back into the NBA. And look, I'm not faulting Norris. He saw an opportunity. He's like, I want to get back in the league. It's some very strong F them kids energy. But it was also, more AA, It played out more AAU-like yes. than competitive college well, they got, wrestling. They got thrashed. Their schedule was – it didn't make sense either. I mean, even beyond the scheduling, you, you – they had so many young guys. They had Ron Holland. They had Manas Puzelis. They had Tyler Smith. They had Baba Carsone. They had Dink Pate. Like, you just go down the list of guys. It's so many kids. It's too many yeah. mouths to feed and too many agendas. And for everybody's like, well, you know, uh, sometimes you got to have some guys sacrifice. These guys are all trying to get theirs. Yeah. And it's not a fault of theirs. They've been told this is where you're going to go so you can learn to be better so you can go get yours. But when you have that many guys trying to get theirs at that young of a spot, and this is what happens not only in the, with the Ignite, but with young teams. Yeah. They're, everybody says, well, a coach should set the, the order and the agenda and the opportunities that are there for everybody to figure out. And it's like, it's not ABC123. It's not as simple as that. There are human natures that step into these things that take the idea, the holistic idea of something, ball it up, shoot it into the sun. Yeah. Because... Whether we like it or not, whether you're 18-year-old you or 19-year-old me, if we have that athletic prowess and we're in those positions, you know what we're doing? We're not looking out for the team. We're looking out for our ability and our chance to get to the NBA and get to the next level to go get that contract. And I think that's where the development of college players, they, they benefit a lot more because you're having to pull in the same direction. And Everybody is. Not only that, you have guys on those teams up and down the rosters that know they are not NBA players. Yeah. They are role players. Hey, they may be seniors. They may lead the team and, and, and you know be the guy through and through, but at some point in time, the young guy might step, up, step out. But you've, you've spent your time. That's kind of the same idea with the Ignite of having the, the sage veterans. Yeah. They know what their role is. The problem was, in this instance, there just were too many mouths to feed. Yeah. So you, you land in a situation where it's just a disaster. Like this text on the Vancouver 4, text on 503-864-6326. I get why the Ignite's at folding, but the level of competition was better than they get in college. Yeah. You're not what? wrong. He's not wrong, but the development wasn't. It, like, it's the same. 
if you go to a if you go to a college program with a great coach, like the guy, we have a sample size that's large enough that we can see, and this is why the NBA is doing it. One, financially, didn't make sense, and two, the results they were a mixed bag, just like any high level recruit that goes from high school to college. It's a mixed bag. It is. It's a mixed bag. And so instead of dumping a bunch of money in this they're getting out of this good and something you and i have talked about offline for a while now i think we might be moving towards the allowing of one or done one and should done, be and the committal to college for at least two years i so think I it's think good it's yeah i think it's good i think it's good for the nba and i think it's good for college sports too this doesn't necessarily mean they're tied to the school yeah but it's two years before you can enter the draft Major League Baseball, I think it does things the, the best when it comes to this stuff. You you want to come out of high school and go into minors? Do it. Go do it. Or you're going to wait three years and go play college, and baseball. Go play college baseball and work on your development there. Yeah. The that N- way the development pipelines stay separate and they make sense. The NFL, I think, does it the worst. I mean, forcing guys to go to college for three years, I understand physically to do it, but not having another avenue or option, that's Maurice tough Claire for guys. Was ready. Yeah. I mean, if a guy is physically ready to go after one or two years, I think two years, they should be able to go after two. And yeah. I think the NFL might be leaning more towards that way. So All right. that's where the G League Ignite is sitting now, and that's kind of a, a change in how the developmental pipeline will work, yeah. and, and probably another change that's going to trickle down to college basketball. <laughs> For sure. All right, coming up next, we will revisit March Madness as we are currently underway here at the Stadium Sports Bar and Grill at a and A. Come on down and join us. Isaac Asuka will be on after us from 3 to 7, and we will keep things going here on Danny and Dusty, Today the Fan.
Spice the Madness, George McCoy and Warren Allen attorneys at Long Coors Light presents Fan Madness Thursday from noon to 7 at X-Golf Twalton and Friday from noon to 7 at X-Golf, X-Golf Vancouver. Let's go. That means you'll get Dusty and I and Isaac and Suk, and Isaac and Suk both at one location on Thursday and then switching it up from Twalton to Vancouver on Friday. Let's go. I'm excited. I love uh, all these Fan Madness events. I mean... This is very hard to top being, you know, at the Stadium Sports Bar and the beautiful uh, a and Resort and Casino. But when you're at X-Golf and you got those simis there it's, and you're playing, uh, you can you can play Pebble Beach and their TV set up there is quite nice. awesome. Quite nice. Yeah. It's the perfect way to enjoy a little, little round two, round three round action. Round like 16 it. action. I like on. it. I like it. Fan Madness is presented by George McCoy at Warren Allen of Attorneys at Law. Injuries and missing work ruining your day. Call George McCoy at WarrenAllen.com. He'll make them pay. Yeah, he will. It's also presented by Coors Light. Nonstop action, nonstop chill. Coors Light. Celebrate wow. responsibly. And again, we are here at the State of Sports Bar and Grill. Had me a few Coors Lights like yesterday. You did. I, I also saw somebody else may or may not have had a picture that... Uh, that turned into another picture, that turned into another picture, that turned into some more beers that you ended up having to uh, take care of. I did. <laughs> <laughs> I was repaid promptly. You were. But, but uh, somebody, somebody may or may not have snuck out of here. May yeah. have been accused of being a guy who would leave a tab by Isaac yeah. and Suk and then ended up being the guy yeah. who, left the tab. who left the tab. Yeah, it was an accident, though. Ah. For somehow he only paid, like, part of his tab. <laughs> And then I was stuck. Like, it was the end of the night. The bartender was just sitting there like, are you kidding me? It was indeed a triple-digit bar tab. It, it was. And I got, I tracked him down. I bird-dogged him. You did. And I said, hey, bro, you either come back or you're going to have to, you're going to have to Venmo me the money. Indeed. And... To his credit, it was uh, promptly Venmoed, and and we we, we got all squaresy. But and he did show up today with his tail firmly between his legs. He did. He did. It did happen. It was a. It was one of those things. I was just like, you've got to be kidding me. But nothing could drag down yesterday. It was a fun day yesterday. No, man. yesterday was absolutely awesome. And the basketball may is is even better today. We haven't had maybe the uh, the upsets or the action going either way against it. But it looks like we might have one brewing. Oh. Colorado is currently tied up. Let's oh. go, Pac-12. Florida is just taking the lead back. 106 remaining in the first half. 42-41 Florida over number 7 seed Florida over 10 seed Colorado. Uh, Let's go. They are getting ready to go to the half. We are getting to that point in the in the afternoon where the uh, the post noon game slates are going to take off. Clemson is closing out. He's uh, heating up quite firmly on New Mexico. They're going to win 77-56. You know. I am is so jealous of the East Coast for this day in particular because it starts first thing in the morning. Well, no, it start no, it doesn't. It, it it's like if you I love our West Coast sports schedule. Oh, I yes. think I think we live the best life uh, when it comes. West to West Coast teams. is best coast for sports time, except for this this one here hmm. because we all know this. It's hard to just like dip out of a full day of work and just be like deuces, I'm out, right? Hmm. But on the East Coast, these games, the 9-15 games, that's 12-15. So they can go oh, and they can, time, yeah. they can fake okay. their way through some work and then get, get out the rest of the day. And, but make no mistake about it. Nobody should be working. Nobody should be going to school. Actually, go to school, kids. But go to school. And you know what? Qu- quick shout out. I didn't do this yesterday. Quick shout out to all of our teachers out mm-hmm. there who are promptly providing TVs in your classrooms, doing putting, the Lord's it, work. putting it up on the uh, projector. Yeah. I, I do remember this is going to date both of us because I'm sure we both had the same TVs because we were, we were in the same general school districts. The TV that you adjusted the dial on. Yeah. The click, <laughs> click, 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 <laughs> click, and it had the little window on it. Yeah. You had to adjust it to get to Channel 6 yeah. so you could get those CBS games because we didn't have true TV back then. Uh-uh. No, true, the, the Impractical Jokers wasn't able to fill 23 hours of inventory no. on true TV, so they didn't have that back then. I remember uh, Mr. Keller in sixth grade, West Union Elementary, rolling in the TV on, mm-hmm. on tourney day, and the big one was uh, for University of Portland in the NCAA tournament. And 
I will never forget how quickly we were like, all right, well, we can turn this game off. It's <laughs> back, back to learning because the pilots got rolled. Uh, shout but that out, was a good day. That was a special day. Shout out Mr. Mackey, Mr. Mavison, and Mr. Edel, all in high school, who threw the NCAA tournament. That old broken TV got wheeled into that classroom. Thing of beauty. And whether you were a basketball fan or not, you were a fan that day because it meant no class. One of my buddies is a uh, elementary school PE teacher, and he he brought in the projector and had it on a whole wall. That's of the, the OG gym. status. Yes, whole wall. That's of the that's gym. that's when you know you're you're doing it good. Now we didn't have the technology for that because the projector we had back then was the one you used to write on. Oh yeah, the overhead yeah, projector. Yeah, you know, yeah. I thought about. I I don't know what made me think about this the other day. But I had, I don't know, it was a dream or something. I woke up in the middle of the night remembering overhead projectors in the scroll. Remember you had to, to roll the plastic over the top of it? There was a, a handle yeah. on each side. Yeah, I do. And how there were certain classes where they would keep the, the scroll in the same place and they'd have the spray bottle to clean it off. And then there were some that would roll it until they got dirty all the way on the entire thing. And then it was a TA's job, like once a semester, to, to clean, like, to spend like an hour just going erase through. the scroll. <laughs> I don't know why that popped up in my head yeah. a couple nights ago, but then I was just like, "Oh God, I wonder if I showed somebody <laughs> that right now that's like 18 years old if they would have any idea what the hell that thing is." Yeah, it's just such a random thing. So there you go. Speaking of random things, the NCAA tournament is rolling along. Oh, what? Oh, I got an update well, on the Portland Pilots women. They're down by 23. Well, line was 22 yesterday, I heard. That's unfortunate. Swag. Maybe they cover. Is in Manhattan. Yeah. And we do have a picture of him having a Manhattan. Truly incredible stuff. Wait, it's uh, second second quarter. They're almost to halftime. I forget that they play halves. The, or quarters, quarters not halves. Yes, they, they they get it right. They do, college basketball. Why men, does men, I don't know. Men need to go to the quarters. I don't understand two things in, in men's college basketball. Okay. Why the three point line isn't pushed out to the NBA level? Yeah. Well, I have you seen three point shooting percentages in college? Yes, I know. But let's push this thing out. <laughs> let's let's put some spacing on the floor. Uh, and okay. the halves. Yeah, halves. The, I don't get. Also, halves why are get. why are why is the game eight minutes shorter? Well, I mean, that's natural progression. You get, uh, uh, well, yeah, that's a good point. I ain't right. College and the NFL are same. The same. Baseball, same. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. High school but you basketball do have the natural... is even shorter. What's that? High school basketball is even shorter. Yeah, 32 minutes to 40 minutes to 48 minutes. And then in, you know, high school football, you go uh, 48 minutes to 60 minutes in college. Sure. But there's yeah. a natural, like, like, Progression. Not, yeah, I don't. I don't really understand that. I, the I'm, weird. I'm not going to lie, Danny. Most of college basketball games, I don't want to see that extra eight minutes. That's fair. But, you know. That also, you know, like what? it's so ugly. I, I, I'll take it back because yeah. because not not only the ugliness. <laughs> if there's more time, that takes away from the variance. Because it allows yeah. the better team to have more time to recover. Oh, great point. The 40 minutes. Well, you mathed that. I did. Yeah, pretty way quickly. to go. The volatility index does definitely kind of go back and forth. Okay. With with, with a shorter eh, hold on point. Uh, did you say hold on? Hold on, everybody. We think. It's over. It's over. Here's we the think. situation. The number of people that have come by the uh, the uh, booth here and said something along the lines of, I want to hear that yeah. drop from yes! Swag. Is Swag here? Is Swag going to be here? Yeah. No, he's in Manhattan, Kansas. Yep. So I bullied him into a, a picture of a Manhattan in Manhattan because that's his drink of choice. Which, yeah, I mean, you have to get it in the, in, the, in its namesake city, right? Yeah. That's and clearly I, where it was made. I feel like I may have bullied him into having a second Manhattan in Manhattan. That man has never Kansas. had to be bullied into another drink. No, he said, I just finished it. I said, well, order another one, damn it, and send me a picture. And he did. <laughs> and he did. It took him a while, but we got it. We got it eventually. So we're now at the point uh, where uh, 
everyone is coming up and giving us the fist bumps on air. Yeah, people have been I people have been drinking. We're watching ball, having a good time. Let's go, baby. It's a good time. Head on down here to the State of Sports Bar and Grill at a and We'll be back in just a minute to talk about the NBA pushing back against their own stupid narrative. But first, here's the big one of the Sports Center update. I hear they got some tasty burgers. <laughs>
Danny and Dusty live on location at the State of Sports Bar and Grill here at a a Resort and Casino. Come on down and join us for all of the March Madness action. Games are hitting halftime and getting the, the early tip-offs for the late afternoon games currently underway. We don't really have the upsets that we had yesterday, but we do have some good basketball being played. The drinks are overflowing. The food is plentiful. And, well, the uh, the machines, the tables, and the uh, the sports desk itself hey, are all wide open. In fact, one of our own placing his very first wager soon. Yeah, Patrick Harris. Patrick Harris pr placing his first legal, professional, grown-up, face-to-face bet at a sports book. Of his first ever. I'm, s I'm so proud of him. I'm happy for him. We man. love to see it. Yeah. We love to yeah. see it. What game for you has been the game that you look at and you go, okay, this is this was a fun upset or this is a this is a good win, but this is the springboard game for this team to make the deep run. I don't think I've seen one yet. Um, I think uh, upset wise, I, I don't know if any of the upsets that we saw are like springboards to making a deep run in the tournament. I think those will come in the round of 32 mostly, but. I was really impressed with uh, Iowa State and just kind of their consistency yesterday. Tennessee shook off a sluggish start, and then they turned on the Jets. I, I think that there is real cause for concern in, in kind of the opposite of what you're saying. There's real cause for concern with Kansas blowing a 22-point lead and damn near losing to Samford. Mm -hmm. And what their depth looks like and that ability, what McCullers can do for you as when a team starts making a run to be the guy who kind of slams the door shut. Um, I think there's real uh, concerns there. And then, dude, how about Gonzaga? I think Gonzaga may be that team. There was a lot of people saying McNeese State was going to beat the Zags. I did pick McNeese State as my upset. As a 12 over a 5. Mm -hmm. And Gonzaga absolutely mopped the floor. Yep with McNeese State yesterday. There was no doubt in that game. They were up 48-25 at halftime, yep, damn near and they doubled them up. just cruised uh, through the rest of the way. So, I, I mean, I look at those games and I say, yeah. Uh, other than that, hot team stayed hot. Oregon stayed hot against South Carolina. NC State stayed hot against Texas Tech. And it, it, maybe that is the one where you sit there and you go, that's a team that – maybe punching their ticket to the Sweet 16 because of the fact that they get Oakland in the next round. Because Oakland upset that Kentucky. Yep. Now NC State, who's playing really good basketball, playing some of their best, well, not some of their best basketball of the season, they get an Oakland team that's going to be riding a high. And how often do we see that team that gets that upset come falling back down to earth in the next round? NC State can keep that going. And then uh, after that game, uh, the winner of NC State in Oakland gets Marquette and or Florida, uh, Colorado, which is a, a tight game right now at the break. It's an interesting one. I, I think that NC State one is the the epitome of a team playing their best basketball at the, at the best possible time. Yeah. And you've got an opportunity here where, I mean, that that was a team that wasn't the the – the offensive firepower yeah. uh, that you thought kind of coming. And they score <laughs> 43 points in the second half, and you kind of look at it and go, uh, oh, okay, maybe there's a little something here. And I don't think we've seen the team of destiny, so to speak, yet. Even, I, I guess maybe you can say UConn because of this just and look, sheer Stetson, dominance. It, UConn did what they're supposed to do. And I think they're really one of the only teams so far that went out there and said, yeah, no, we we are not going to mess around. Mm -hmm. I, I, you can make the argument for North Carolina over Wagner, 90 to 62. They're up 40 to 28 and a half. They score 50 points in the second half. Arizona struggles early with Long Beach State. You can't trust the Wildcats. They got off the mat, though, and they they sure look like a different 44 team. 44 points second half. And, again, you're seeing a lot of second half adjustments. Tennessee and, and Iowa State. I think those are two teams who they took care of business early. They took care of business late. Yeah. They were able to kind of coast through some games there and put things away in a manner of, like, professionalism. And that's why when I look at that bracket and I see UConn and Iowa State and yeah. Auburn in the same bracket, whoever comes out of that bracket is going to be the most tested team in this tournament, like, hands down. Yesterday we saw a ton of unders, and I think maybe the, the early story of this tournament is 
we saw a lot of unders in, in point totals hitting, but second half, second you, half saw, overs. you saw overs hit, but from the non-gambling standpoint, what you saw was those teams that we expected to be good, there's a lot of jitters in that first half mm -hmm. of, of an NCAA tournament. And so they shook off the rust, and the teams that ended up pulling away in those second halves, the Arizonas, um, what Oregon did, 53 in that second half. North Carolina put up a 50 spot in the second half against Wagner where they played with their food a little bit early. The teams that elevated in that second half, I think they're going to be the ones that are going to be the most comfortable as we as we move into the round of 32. It's an interesting spot for everybody to be right yeah. now. Colorado, Florida now tied up at halftime, 45 Ooh. apiece. Colorado sneaking in here. Co Colorado ultimately losing in the Pac-12 title game to Oregon. They are a team that they have got guys in K.J. Simpson, Tristan De Silva, and obviously Cody Williams, who's the likely lottery pick, uh, likely a top five pick in this year's NBA draft. Cody Williams is coming off an injury, and he has not looked the same. He is on a minutes restriction. He is coming off the bench. He is, I believe, last I looked, he was still scoreless. And he has not been a guy who's been impactful at all since he came back. Yeah, he's, I'm sorry, he does have two free throws now. He is 0 for 1 in his few minutes on the floor. And that is a weapon for them that is uh, sorely lacking as K.J. Simpson is probably one of the best point guards in the country. Tristan Da Silva, a bit of a unique player. Yeah. But you look at that team and you go, why isn't this team doing more? Why isn't this team being more effective? And that's really been the story of the season for them throughout the or throughout the, the Pac-12 play. Yeah, uh, they were a a team that had that talent that you said. That and this is the the world of college hoops, right? This is why it's infuriating for NBA fans to sit down and watch college basketball. Um, if you were just strictly an NBA fan, is because of that consistently inconsistent play, you know, mm -hmm. and. It's pervasive throughout all of college basketball, but it Colorado kind of is like the poster child of that idea and that thinking. They're just they college kids, man. College kids. That's that's basically what it comes down to is the the variance that you get in their play it, from night to night, from half to half. Yeah, it's a roller coaster. Yeah, no, it's it's gonna be interesting to see how this shakes out, particularly for the Pac-12 or Pac-12, Pac-2. The remaining teams, Colorado contributing to the pool or, and or not uh, as we push forward into uh, day three this weekend. How deep How deep do you think the Ducks can run? Is this um, it or, or, or do you think this, this they, can, they can pull the upset on Creighton? I, I think they can upset Creighton okay. because Kustard waking up, if he, if, and again, this is that, consistency that has been plaguing Oregon. Mm -hmm. A lot of that was just they were so injury riddled, injury riddled throughout the course of the year that it was it, it kind of continued roller coaster on who is in and out of the lineup. Now you're starting to see they've got their core and with Kusnard playing the way he did in South Carolina. If you get anything close to that and you have the continue uh, continued efficiency from Infali Dante on both ends of the floor, it, they can they can beat not just Creighton, but uh, I mean, I, I think t Tennessee's a whole other animal that they're going to have to to chew on if they if they get past Texas. But I think Sweet Sixteen is is one hundred percent in the in the sides of Oregon. But they do. I mean, they've got Creighton has size, and they got shooters, man. Which come NCAA and, tournament time, everybody talks about guard play. And McDermott is one hell of a basketball coach. Yeah, always has been, always will be. Yes, sir. All right, coming up next, we'll get you ready to hand you off to Isaac and Suke here. Coming up on Danny and Dusty, Tenny the Fan.
want to pass a little note along here. Yeah. On the NBA side of things, I don't know if you've seen the back and forth the NBA has done and done the worst PR job imaginable as it pertains to why the, the scoring has changed in the NBA. They had Joe Dumars go on Zach Lowe and say, no, we didn't actually make any changes. There was no edict sent to the referees. And then, like, six hours later, the NBA sent out a notice saying, yeah, no, we did uh, really reemphasize new rule or uh, rule changes within our NBA officials. They can't make up their minds on what they're actually saying. And the, the thing is, they're turning away good PR because the product is better. It is better. Even though the scoring <laughs> is down, the product is way more palatable. Games are going by faster. And here's the thing that Dumars kind of stepped in in the Zach Lowe podcast is like, no, if you look at it, the whole reason why it, it, scoring is down is because there's fewer possessions. Yeah, because you're not blowing the whistle every trip down yeah. the floor. You're not generating possessions by creating free throw possessions. Yeah, you stop play, shoot free throws, and then balls going back down, creating an extra mm -hmm. opportunity in possession, especially when you call you know, a hand check, for example, mm -hmm. right? All of a sudden, you get to the bonus quicker because of the ticky tack nature. That's of, the biggest of the part of this is the bonus being, and then every whistle goes to the free throw line, yep. creating extra possessions. Like, no, it one hundred percent. In the, I think this is why the NBA is so in their own head about it. It's because of the fact that with the Tim Donaghy thing, yes, with every official being on the take, you know, if they make a bad call mm -hmm. or whatever. They are so conscious and obsessed with the fact that we're not manipulating games, yet it's they show that they can. Officiating changes the outcome of yes. basketball more so than any other officials and because of every single possession. If you have a whistle, they add up. And the league is showing that they can, in fact, manipulate said outcome. That's right. By by driving home emphasis, oh, okay. literally. Flipping a switch. <laughs> it's all very dumb. Uh, just admit it, figure it out, yeah. get better refs, and move on. And look, I think officiating will get better as you, as it goes on because they cycled out a lot of old officials. You have so many inexperienced officials that are that are refing right now. Like I, I saw, what is the average crew age has like or years of service? Less than six and a half years average. And it, it used to be brutal, up, like 15. It used to be, yeah, <laughs> fi like 15.8 and 15, it's at 6.1 yeah. now yeah. or something like that. They did a really poor it's job crazy. of uh, for about a 10-year period of bringing new new refs in. But the, here's with the with NBA fans, though, they were complaining about all those officials being too old and, you know, your Dick Bavetta's, you know, limping the up Joey and down Crawford's, the floor. Yeah. yeah. Well, they fans got their wish and they got it in mass with those retirements. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what changes? All of a sudden, you have new and inexperienced refs and that becomes a whole other can of worms that you have to open Yeah, you got to pay the piper.